things have uh, evolved quickly over uh, from when we talked right before uh, the holidays back in early December. Uh, so again, we, we try to do these a minimum of once a month to share information as best we can to speak directly to our folks in Genesee and Orleans County and let them know what's going on to the best of our ability. And it, it is challenging uh, as things are changing so rapidly, you know, we're working to digest this information, uh, make sense of it, and then try to articulate it clearly back out. Um, so uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time walking through some of those changes today. Uh, again, just trying to make sure our folks have the as best of understanding as they can uh, to what some of these changes are. And, um, you know, again, we'll continue to do that moving forward. Uh, I do have some data that I'll share, uh, kind of updates on our, our numbers locally and, and some information around testing and, and some other uh, key points that we want to share. And then obviously we're, we're very happy to try to answer any questions uh, that may be out there um, that we can articulate. And if we don't have the answers, we'll get back to you. As always, I do have a couple of my folks in the background uh, that are on this call that will be adding information into the chat box. So as we go along, they'll be putting in potential links and uh, different information. And if you have questions, uh, you can feel free to ask them in the chat and we'll capture those and they may answer them as we go along. So uh, it's nice having those folks uh, helping us out. So thank you for doing that. Uh, in addition, um, you know, we're just gonna, uh, again, uh, open it up for questions after I talk and after Dan uh, shares a few things on the hospital side and um, you know we'll, we'll again try to answer what we can but as I start all of these calls I do want to uh, send a shout out and thank you to my staff um, both Genesee and Orleans County Health Department um, you know they continue to work uh, very steadfast and continue to put in a, a lot of great efforts um, we've had a significant surge and we'll share some of those numbers uh, here in a minute uh, but over the holidays, um, you know, uh, Omicron has really taken root uh, here in Genesee and Orleans County, like the rest of the counties around the region and the state and the country. And uh, the amount of work and effort that's gone into, you know, try to track these cases and, and deal with the, the implications of those higher numbers, um, and including the, the pressures on our healthcare system that Dan will talk about, uh, are, are things that, um, you know, have taken a lot of time. So again, I just want to um, give a shout out to my folks and uh, thank them for the work that they continually do and have done during these uh, unprecedented, unprecedented increases and in spikes in cases and uh, continued operations around testing and vaccination efforts. So um, with that, I'll uh, move along to some data update. Um, as I just mentioned, we have seen a, a, sh a very sharp increase in positivity rates and, and pure raw number of cases in COVID and spread in our community uh, and in, in congregate settings in both Genesee and Orleans County over the last uh, several weeks specifically. And uh, we do know that this is being driven by the Omicron variant um, and a lot of post-holiday surge. Uh, Omicron has been isolated and verified to be in Genesee County. Uh, we received that uh, notification a couple weeks ago. Uh, it has not been identified uh, by lab uh, verification in Orleans County yet. Uh, but again, uh, we do believe, and, and based on the number of spread and what we're having, that it is here, and um, it is the primary driver of these cases. Um, you know, we as, as we go through some of this data, I just want to make sure everybody's aware. Our website, uh, Go Health New York or NY.org, is um, the primary site that we want folks to go to to receive information locally from us. Uh, we have tabs on there for vaccination, uh, where you can go on and sign up for vaccination clinics. We also have a tab on there for testing. Uh, if you click on that, you can report at home tests, you can sign up for testing clinics, you can get information on testing in different locations. Um, and then we also have a new tab on the New York State uh, guidelines for isolation and quarantine that we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but we try to make it fairly intuitive so folks can go on and get the information that they're looking for. Um, it's it's kind of tab based, so you should be able to click and, and move forward through the throughout the website. But um, again, I believe the, the link is being posted there for uh, individuals to be able to uh, use use that as they need. Uh, on a data standpoint, uh, just some big uh, bigger raw numbers. Genesee County is currently at 12,105 total positives um, that have been uh, identified and we're at 164 total deaths. And again, that's tracked per the New York State Department of Health um, data. Um, uh, that's how we're reporting out deaths at this point. In Orleans County, we are at 7,654 total positives and 104 total deaths um, that have been uh, tracked due to COVID uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, as we dive deeper into this, we put out a, a report uh, yesterday that had uh, some additional data points. And, um, you know, you can see that there's a significant increase of activity uh, over the last uh, couple weeks, uh, specifically into January. And again, this is primarily due to Omicron with the high uh, infectious nature of that variant and um, just the amount of spread 
we can attribute to holiday gatherings, right? We, we did a lot of education pre-holidays about trying to do uh, COVID smart, COVID safe gatherings. Um, but as we know, people got together and um, we did see a significant spike um, in the number of cases following Christmas, following New Year's and, and the data is reflective of that significant spike. And again, we were not unique in this. This was seen uh, again around the state. Um, just for a little reference point, Genesee County had 1,509 positive cases in December. And in January, the first uh, 10 days of January, we have 2,118 recorded um, in, in 10 days compared to the whole month of December. If we look at Orleans County, we had uh, 938 uh, cases identified in December. And through uh, January 10th, again, we've had 1,125. Uh, so again, just from a reference point, you can see that uh, things are very busy. There's a lot of uh, activity going on in our community right now, um, which, which is one of one of the genesis has, has driven some of these changes that I'm going to talk about in isolation and quarantine um, procedures and, and case um, investigations and contact tracing. I uh, just want to be uh, just remind everybody that the, again, COVID-19 um, breakthrough data is available, um, and uh, if, if folks visit the New York State Department of Health website again. Um, with a lot of the changes that are occurring, our ability to capture a lot of the local data that we historically have been able to push out uh, weekly or multi uh, times during the week uh, is changing. Uh, as we don't do the thorough case investigations and we're not into doing the contact tracing with the shift, we're going to lose our ability to capture some of these data points real time. And unfortunately, that's uh, you know a bit of the trade off. Uh, but we are going to be uh, obviously still tracking the positives, tracking whatever data we can. But I just wanted to let folks know that that is shifting. Uh, most counties, including ourselves, are now going to be pointing towards the state data, um, again, on the state website, and for people to be able to pull that data. It's not necessarily real time as, as well as we were keeping track of it. Um, there's often uh, significant corrections that are occurring uh, over time, uh, but that's really the best place to receive uh, some of these specifically demographic data that folks may be looking for. Um, and locally, we will be pushing out our data on Wednesdays on our social media accounts and our websites. Um, so that's where people will be able to see uh, anything that we're able to offer locally. We're going to have some charts and graphs with trend lines. So we'll be able to, you know, see the up and downs locally, what's going on with numbers. Uh, but again, this is really due with uh, kind of the shift in approach. Um, so we're, we're responding to that with, uh, again, adjusting what we're going to be reporting out. All right, so just uh, just bear with me for a little bit. I, I just want to take a couple minutes here to try to do a little clarification that give uh, kind of some level setting on some of the new, the terms that we're using here, just so there's a better understanding in the community. I've heard uh, case investigations, contact tracing kind of uh, conflated and interchanged with one another, um, especially with a lot of stuff in the news and just talking about this. Um, so when we look at COVID, we've been doing this since day one. We do this with any type of uh, virus or illness. When we talk about case investigations, this is when someone from uh, you know, the state or local health department calls a positive case. So these are people that actually have confirmed um, disease, right? They've tested positive. So we do an investigation from there. Um, it typically involves looking at demographic questions, you know, their name, address, um, you know, different, different data points that we're asking about. Um, you know, we look at symptoms, we look at date of onset of symptoms. Um, you know, we, we look at a list of, we ask you about your close contacts and, um, you know, we, we try to identify uh, the duration of exposure, exposure locations. We're really investigating that case, right? Trying to identify as much as we can about uh, the person's history over the last 48 hours from when they tested positive or symptom onset so that then we can, um, you know, identify those contacts, right? So that's a case investigation. Contact tracing uh, takes it a little bit further, right? So we identify the contacts in the case investigation uh, of the positive case. And then what we're doing is, um, you know, trying to identify those that were exposed. So when we talk about contact tracing, it, it's really um, identifying um, the exposed individuals and then historically under COVID to this date, uh, you know, we were putting those folks under quarantine, right? So the isolation is the positives, the quarantines are those that are exposed to the positive. And, um, you know, it really depends on the disease, but for the purpose of COVID, obviously we've been looking at that within six feet of an infected person for a minimum of, uh, for a total of at least 15 minutes, right? Um, that is shown um, uh, to be the case definition for exposure with COVID. So those folks will be identified, put on quarantine. So when we say that we're suspending contact tracing, and that's what the governor uh, put out the other day across the state that, um, you know, they are now not mandating contact um, tracing any longer. Uh, it's going to be up to the locals and to what extent and how they want to do contact tracing based on capacity and availability. We're talking about the 
actual efforts of our staff or the state staff identifying those contacts when we do the case investigation, calling them up, putting them on formal quarantine. So that, that's really what's shifting. The case investigations, the positives needing to isolate, to stay home, to get their orders, that is not changing. Case investigations are, are still going to be occurring for positives. Uh, it's just that that contact tracing piece is going to be um, flipping back over to the cases to identify their own contacts, to notify them, and then the uh, contacts will put themselves on quarantine uh, based on the new procedure. So with the new system um, rolled out by the state, uh, every person that tests positive for COVID with a lab test or if a reported home test uh, through our website, again, if you take a home test and you don't report it, um, there's really no official way to track that you did it and that it was positive, et cetera. So we do have that home-based um, uh, system set up on our website. Many counties have that, that, uh, that does get uploaded and uh, can be um, investigated like a regular lab-based positive test. Um, so any, anybody with a, a lab test or home test uh, through our system, uh, the message will indicate from the state system that they've tested positive, that that person should isolate for at least five days uh, in line with the new guidance, that they should notify their close contacts, again, that I just talked about kind of is the, in the case investigation process or the case uh, tracing process, and then visit their local health department website to download and to uh, receive their isolation and, quor and quarantine orders. Um, again, those are all up on the website now. Uh, you're able to do that. There's a self-attestation um, that you attest that you have a positive test, and these are the dates. These are your onset of symptom dates, and then you uh, are able to print out your own order. After that five-day period, uh, again, you will then print out your release from isolation letter. If you're on quarantine, very similarly, you would download your orders. You would attest that you were a, a close contact of a positive. And then after five days, you will then download um, your release from quarantine orders that you would then provide that letter. And depending on what your, uh, you know, your employer is looking for, they may want to see the order and the release letter. They may just want the release letter. Um, so you're going to have to talk with your employer um, or the school or whatever they are, depending on what they want in, as far as documentation um, you know, to come back to work or to school. Uh, but those are all on the website. Um, they're all able to be retrieved now and uh, that they, they are there moving forward for folks to use. All right. Um, so just keep in mind, again, with this process, uh, there's not going to be uh, any follow up from the county or the, the contact tracers at that point. Um, we're asking people to self isolate for that five day period. Again, notify your close contacts that they have been exposed that you're positive, uh, again, based on that definition. And um, they should quarantine for, again, that minimum of five days and uh, ideally get tested uh, after that five day period just to confirm that they're negative uh, before they again go back to work, go back out into public. Um, but, uh, you know, again, that's uh, part of the process and we'll talk about testing in a minute. Uh, just so everybody's aware, the health department may still conduct uh, case investigations and, and do a more thorough deep dive into certain areas, particularly congregate settings, uh, which could include uh, nursing homes, senior living centers. Uh, schools, et cetera, um, just due to the increase of potential spread risk and uh, severity in certain populations. Again, we know that COVID uh, again, has a higher severity level in seniors and those with underlying health conditions. So we will be active and involved uh, more so in some of these congregate settings um, than we are going to be in the general public. Um, so again, the focus moving forward will be for those higher um, risk areas uh, as far as our efforts into contact tracing. Um, just a little bit too with, with about um, the, the talk about this shift again, there's been a lot of discussion and questions on this, um, you know, with the spike of COVID-19 cases throughout Genesee and Orleans County, um, as well as the state, uh, contact tracing is not as effective um, in these situations. Um, and this is one of the drivers behind why this shift is occurring now with unprecedented numbers we've talked about. Um, you know, it, it's virtually impossible for us to get to all of these contacts and to do this effectively. So you, you really need to, you're really looking to triage and focus on those positive cases. Um, you know, just for example, if, if, you know, 500 people test positive, which we had over the weekend in, in Genesee County or two days, um, each of those people typically we've seen historically so far have anywhere from five to 10 direct contacts, um, just based on, you know, household contacts, if they went to an event, uh, you know, into the community. That puts anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 people that technically should be put on quarantine. Um, as you can imagine, that number is virtually impossible to um, reach these folks, <laughs> uh, depending on even when we find out about the positive. So, uh, you know, when, when you look at that time, per, that time period, um, it, it, 
contact tracing is just ineffective um, when you have that type of community spread. When you have one or two cases of tuberculosis or, you know, you have a, a small clusters of measles or even with COVID, what we've seen, when you have small numbers, it's very effective. You identify the positive, you put the, you know, the handful, 10, 20 people on quarantine, and you can handle that. But when you get to these higher numbers, um, you know, we obviously have to move away from it. Uh, you know, because of this, though, um, you know, we are shifting our resources. Uh, it doesn't mean we're done working. We're not. We're not following this. We we need folks to comply. Um, nothing has really shifted in the potential risk of exposure and the risk of secondary infection. Um, you know, these people that were formally should have been put on quarantine by us formally, we're now asking to self quarantine. Um, there's still a probability that you may become positive, which is why we want you to take that test, especially if you become symptomatic. Um, it's just that we're shifting the, the mandated uh, push from us where we're going to be contacting people. Uh, with this shift, though, in, in um, you know, responsibilities, uh, the health department obviously is going to be able to refocus uh, some of our efforts and, and move some F uh, capacity also over towards increased vaccinations, increased testing efforts, and continuing to provide education. Um, you know, so we uh, obviously will still be working hard and making sure we're um, communicating and, and clearly trying to articulate what's going on in, in our communities, even with this shift away from uh, the heavy burden of uh, contact tracing. Uh, so real quick, just with isolation and quarantine, uh, again, the new guidance came out last week. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just in general, uh, the uh, isolation has been reduced down to five days. Um, if the individual is asymptomatic at the end of five days or their symptoms are resolving. Uh, again, if someone is still very symptomatic, still not feeling great, they should still remain in isolation for up to that 10 day period, just like they would under the previous um, uh, guidance. Uh, after that five day period, the other important thing is that people wear those masks, uh, well-fitting masks out in public. Um, the data and the reason for some of these shifts is uh, based in what we're discovering with the spread of disease, particularly with Omicron that most people are infectious up to two days before they become symptomatic and two to three days after they become symptomatic. That does not mean that you cannot, that you're, you know, you're symptom free and you're not shedding the virus after five days, which is why we want folks to wear that mask. That is still possible that you still could be um, potentially infectious after that five days, but based on the, um, you know, when we look at risk factors and the, the percentages, the majority of the spread is occurring again two days before up to two to three days after which is again why the cdc shortened that time period down to five days um, so again a little bit of uh, responsibility in there making sure again you're staying home if you're sick you continue to stay home for up to that 10-day period and very importantly wear that well-fitting mask 100 um, percent of time when you're around folks after you if you leave at five days just to, to be sure um, to, to make sure we're, we're knocking out any potential incidental exposures. Also, individuals who are moderately severely immune compromised, um, the recommendation is for them to continue to still follow that 10 day isolation period, not the shortened five day window. Um, and then those folks that are unable to wear that well fitting mask after five days um, should again, continue to follow that 10 day period. And again, just for the reason I mentioned, you still may be infectious. So if you can't wear a mask for medical reasons, or uh, whatever it may be, uh, the guidance is to continue to stay in isolation for that five day period. Jumping over to quarantine again, uh, that has now been uh, dropped down to five days from 10, somewhere to isolation. Um, there were a few changes with this, uh, you know, that the state and the new state guidance. So if not fully vaccinated, or fully vaccinated and eligible for a booster, but not yet boosted. Um, the state now um, is uh, asking those folks to quarantine for five days and wear a well-fitting um, well mask again for that additional five days. So the little bit of change here was uh, the prior guidance. Uh, you did not have to have your booster shot to avoid quarantine. If you were fully vaccinated, you were able to avoid it. The new guidance is if you're eligible for that booster, so you got that shot more than five months ago, if you're Moderna or Pfizer or two months ago, Johnson & Johnson, um, you know, you are now um, uh, being asked to quarantine for that five day period. If you're fully vaccinated and boosted when eligible, um, no quarantine uh, necessary, but again, uh, monitor for symptoms. Make sure you're getting that test if you start to become symptomatic, especially if, you know, it's exposure based and, um, you know, you can uh, proceed from there uh, after that five day period. Um, you know, jumping over to schools uh, real quick, um, just as I mentioned every month, uh, we continue to and I, I actually myself meet with all of our school superintendents in both Genesee and Orleans County on a weekly basis. Uh, so we do talk about these uh, different changes that are occurring. Uh, we did have some updated guidance come out last Tuesday from the state uh, for schools 
Obviously, I think there's been a lot in the news already about a letter that was sent out by the health commissioner earlier this week for schools with pending updated guidance coming. As of this conversation we're having, we have not received that updated guidance. Uh, we are not changing any approaches really in, in doing any type of um, uh, modifications until we get that updated guidance. Um, and really see what's in there so we can, uh, again, have discussions with the schools to see how we're going to proceed with some of these recommendations and, and guidance. Um, I will tell you that uh, all of our superintendents and myself, we remain very committed to keeping our schools open, to keeping our kids in their classroom, and to continue with in-person learning. Uh, and again, we're, we're trying to do this and, and balance, obviously, the health safety risk and making sure that our kids are, are in schools and uh, learning in the setting that they, they should be. So we are working hard to make sure that's happening. Uh, we are getting, uh, again, record number of absenteeisms uh, with people out, uh, teachers, staff out. And, uh, you know, our schools are doing a great job of trying to balance and, and manage and keep, keep things running. Uh, which is why it's very important, again, that, you know, if we're symptomatic, we keep our kids home, we don't send them to school, um, and, and we get that test done, and if they are positive, keep them home for at least that five-day five, five day period. Um, additional guidance is also expected uh, from the CDC for congregate care settings. Uh, we expect that to be coming out, too, and again, that would include, um, you know, our, our correctional facilities, shelters, child cares, nursing homes, residential uh, long-term care settings. Uh, so again, we're waiting on that guidance also. So when that does come out, obviously we will be, um, you know, putting out information and sharing how that's going to impact us here in uh, Genesee and Orleans County. All right. Um, so, uh, you know, as we've talked about, I'm going to go over to um, uh, the, the vaccine just a little bit and uh, talk about where we are with our vaccine update. Uh, so, you know, again, COVID-19 vaccines are readily available. Um, as we've talked about before, we have the full cadre of offerings here um, in Genesee and Orleans County, whether it's through the health department, whether it's through pharmacy, some providers are vaccinating. Um, we know that the, the vaccine is uh, very important in preventing particularly severity of illness, and including death. Um, you know, our data has clearly shown, and maybe Dan will share some of this, but, um, you know, those folks that are fully vaccinated um, are, are faring much better um, than those that are unvaccinated. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, those that are boosted. Uh, most of the hospitalizations that we've seen are from folks that have not gotten their booster shot if they're eligible, uh, and including those uh, unfortunate passings and deaths that we have related to COVID. Um, the, the strong majority of those are not vaccinated, and, and none that I've, we've seen have been boosted at this point. So the importance of getting the vaccine is still there. As Shelly mentioned in the beginning, uh, getting vaccinated and getting boosted are two of her points, I believe, um, that can really help us in this surge uh, to, to get people protected and uh, keep them safe from severity of disease. Uh, both Genesee and Orleans County Health Departments uh, are offering, uh, again, our weekly vaccination clinics. Uh, we're vaccinating Wednesday in Genesee County and Thursday in Orleans County. We would encourage anybody to, again, go to our website. Uh, you're able to register for your appointments very easily there. And again, if you're looking for first dose, second dose, third dose, booster, uh, whatever it may be, uh, we can uh, provide that for you. So um, hopefully it's fairly intuitive to sign up. If you have any questions, you can let us know. Uh, but ultimately, um, that is available for you, and uh, we'd encourage you to take a look at it. In addition, folks can go to the State Department of Health website, and there's a vaccine locator. Um, tab, and you can go there and, and type in your address, and it'll show all the different locations within whatever mileage um, circumference you want to look at, what's available, and then you can go to that website and, um, you know, sign up uh, via that, that method. Um, as far as uh, vaccinations, just uh, real quick on the numbers, total population in New York State uh, is about 78.9% with at least one dose and 70.5% with the completed vaccine series. And again, this is total population. Again, you can cut it by 18 and older or five and older, whatever you wanna look at. Um, but again, that's uh, just in general, the uh, New York state numbers. If we drill down and look at the Finger Lakes region, uh, we're at 73.4% um, total population with at least one dose, 66.8% of the, uh, the population. And I'm sorry, this is for uh, eight, uh, ages five and older, not total population. 66.8% with the completed series and 31.5% uh, uh, have received their booster shot of those um, uh, of, the, of the population five and older. And again, that doesn't account for eligibility because again, you gotta meet those uh, time frames to be eligible. Um, jumping over to Genesee County, uh, drilling down a little further, we're at 64.1% of the population with at least one dose. 58.9% with completed vaccine series and 23.6% uh, with that booster dose. Orleans County, 61.4, 61.4% 61 
of the population with at least one dose, 55% with completed vaccine series, and 206 um, with their uh, booster shot. Uh, so again, numbers are creeping up slow, uh, definitely not where we want them to be. They are lower than the Finger Lakes as a whole, and obviously lower than New York State as a whole. Um, you know, as far as booster shots, again, we've talked about it a little bit, but we are strongly rec recommending people go get their boosters when they're eligible. Um, it is showing clearly that um, that is um, providing an extra layer of protection, especially during this Omicron um, surge. Uh, Pfizer has uh, boosters available for 12 and older. Uh, once you're um, eligible and you're at least five, mo five months out from your previous shot, again, Moderna, five months from your completed series, you're eligible for that booster shot. And J&J, &J, again, is at two months. Uh, homebound individuals, we've been getting a lot of calls still from homebound folks, whether they're looking for their initial shots or whether they're looking for the booster. Uh, we are taking those uh, names from folks. So if you want to call up, uh, we are uh, we do have a list. And as uh, our staffing is available, we are going out and vaccinating uh, individuals that are having trouble getting out of their homes for that booster shot. If um, you can't wait for us to get out to you, again, um, you know we'll try to link you up with some resources where maybe you can get that shot sooner. Uh, but Feel free to call us. We will get out there and we'll uh, try to get you um, that that shot as uh, qu as quickly as we can. Um, you know, it may take a little bit of time. Uh, obviously, with the shift in efforts here um, around from uh, you know, obviously the contact tracing piece that may free up some additional um, capacity for us to get out into the homes and do some of this uh, uh, homebound work a little bit uh, quicker uh, for folks. All right, so let's jump over to testing. Um, a couple things here. So testing is uh, a lot going on this. Matt obviously shared a little bit about the efforts that's being done um, uh, with the counties as far as giving out the test kits received from the state. I uh, will comment quickly that uh, Orleans also received test kits. Uh, we did get those out to the villages and the towns as distribution points, and they went fairly quick. Again, we did not receive as large of a number as we were expecting, uh, unfortunately, of these OTC or take-home test kits. Uh, we do expect hopefully to get more of those um, and again Orleans will be pushing them out similar to Genesee through diff different distribution points whether through the town or village offices, libraries, uh, county office building um, and the goal is to get those out to folks as quickly as we can. They are limited, um, you know, there's not a lot of them available so we're asking folks when you do receive these, um, you know, don't just take them immediately just because you got one. Um, we really want people to hold on to these and use them when they need them. Uh, you maybe you're coming symptomatic uh, and you don't, you know, you want to check before you go to work or before you send your kids to school. Uh, maybe you're going to go to a big party, a gathering and an event, and you just want to be sure that you're not positive, even if you're asymptomatic. So you're not going to go show up at that event and potentially spread COVID around. So, um, you know, they are available, but again, they're very limited. So if you use it and it's gone, you may not have it for when you really may need it. Um, so again, use them, keep them, um, and, and have them for when uh, they're indicated for some type of an event or symptomatic testing, those type of things. Uh, we, we talked about the site in Albion uh, a little bit. We had some press come out. This opened up a few weeks back. So we do have a uh, state-sponsored uh, testing site in Albion. It's at the GCC campus, which is at 456 West Avenue in Albion. Um, again, the, 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 the GCC site uh, center, probably most people would recognize that as. Uh, they have registration and walk-ins uh, acceptable um, that they accept. So, you know, folks can walk in and get their uh, test and or make their appointment. Uh, there is a web address for people to sign up. And this is being uh, run by BioReference. Uh, this is the company the state has the contract with. So it's not being run by the state. It's not being run by us at the local health department. Uh, we don't really have any insight or say of what goes on there per se. Uh, we're just helping to promote it, encourage people to go there. Uh, they do have PCR testing, and uh, those folks that have uh, engaged in that process, I know it's been frustrating. Uh, the turnaround time is a little bit longer than they had indicated it would be. Uh, they were originally talking about one to two days. It's been taking three to five to six days, which is problematic. Uh, the state is aware of this, and obviously the company is aware of this. And, um, you know, I think they're, you know, obviously they do these testing sites around the state. And due to the unprecedented uh, cases we've had, unfortunately, there's a backlog in trying to run these tests, uh, I guess, in a timely fashion as we'd like to see it. Uh, they have indicated that that um, that time frame is reducing and should be getting better and hopefully more in line with that one to two day results. Uh, we need people to take advantage of this testing opportunity. We fought hard. Uh, everybody knows we've talked about the um, uh, inability to have rural testing, particularly throughout this entire pandemic. 
Uh, this is, is really one of the first opportunities we've had a state sponsored free testing site for our residents. And it's not just Orleans, any Genesee, Monroe, Erie, anybody can come to these sites. Um, so we really need to take advantage of it. Uh, we don't want it to disappear from lack of utilization uh, because that, that potentially could happen. So uh, the good news, what I'd like to report today is uh, we did verify this morning that they are starting to offer rapid testing starting today. So um, they opened at 10. So you can go down there right now and get a rapid test for free. And uh, the, they have those results uploaded to your, your portal when you when you engage with them, you, you get a uh, online portal of how to get your results um, within an hour. So again, uh, we'd like people to go down. If, you're, if you need rapid testing, um, go down there, they have it. And uh, we're very pleased to see that they've added this new uh, testing modality in, not just the PCR test, but also the rapid. And again, we're hoping to see the turnaround time increase quickly here on the uh, PCR testing. Uh, we are continuing to test at the health department, very um, uh, limited at the moment. Uh, we're testing in Genesee on Fridays and Orleans on Tuesdays, uh, pending on what happens at the uh, state site. Again, we're going to be referring most folks down there, especially for rapid testing. It's six days a week from 10 to 7, uh, so Monday through Saturday, a lot of availability. Uh, if you're going to sign up for our testing, you can do that through, again, our website and uh, receive your appointment that way. Uh, if you're coming to our place currently, we're only offering uh, rapid tests. We do not have PCR at the moment. Um, we'll notify folks if that changes. Uh, just keep in mind that antigen testing is not often acceptable for travel uh, or medical appointments, et cetera. You need to have that PCR level. So make sure you check ahead and uh, verify that before you uh, sign up and show up and find out uh, the test we gave you is not sufficient because uh, that um, you know, often doesn't make anybody happy. So. Um, all right, so that's, that's a bit on testing. Uh, just on guidance again real quick, masking, New York State is still under a mask mandate uh, until at least February 1st now, so a few more weeks, and we'll see at that point if the governor is going to be extending that. Um, for all public places, uh, currently both Genesee and Orleans County are categorized as high level of community transmission per the CDC's definition. Um, so both under substantial and high, which we are, the CDC recommends that anyone unvaccinated or vaccinated wear a well-fitting mask indoors and in crowded uh, outdoor settings. So again, that is the recommendation uh, by the CDC. And again, New York State does have that mandate in place. And again, we uh, obviously, as we've talked about with the surge with Omicron, we, we want folks to um, you know wear those masks as indicated. Um, all right, so um, as, I, as I wrap up, I'm gonna turn this over to Dan here in a minute. Uh, just uh, always a reminder around uh, our precautions. You know, we're still in a pandemic. Uh, we're still uh, trying to uh, respond to high numbers of cases. Uh, again, I believe we are moving towards that endemic model. Some of these changes that we've uh, made here with reducing the time down, uh, moving away from the heavy contact tracing component. Um, you know, things are shifting in how we're responding to things and, and, and how we're going to move forward uh, dealing with COVID. Uh, but as always, you know, make sure, number one, you're staying home if you're symptomatic. Um, we still can get a lot of uh, feedback from folks when we talk to them. Oh, I just thought it was a cold. <laughs> I thought it was a sniffle. I just had a little bit of a cough. So I went to work. I sent my kids to school. And um, when they test positive, they're shocked. Uh, you know, so we, we really want people to take advantage of testing. But uh, first and foremost, stay home. Uh, seek out that test. Again, it, here now in Albion, uh, you can come get that rapid test and, and verify really quickly. Uh, if you're positive. So um, that's the number one thing. Stay home. Same messaging we've always had for flu uh, every year. <laughs> um, and and uh, that's one of the biggest things we can do. Make sure you're washing your hands often. Uh, keeping that social distance is able. Staying six feet away from others. Avoid close contact with people, um, especially if they're, they're sick in the home environment. Um, you know, again, wear your mask uh, indoors, uh, as indicated, or in uh, crowded public outdoor settings. Uh, monitor your health daily, stay home if you're experiencing any symptoms, and again, seek out that test and stay home and isolate uh, for a minimum of that five days uh, if able. Uh, I mentioned this the last couple months, I'm going to just take a quick second. It is flu season. Um, we do have flu circulating. Um, we have had more this year already than we had all of last year, just so everybody's up to date on the numbers. Um, through at least January 1st, Genesee County had 54 lab confirmed flu cases and Orleans has had 17. Uh, you may recall last year, it was virtually non-existent, at least from laboratory confirmed. Uh, so there is flu circulating, uh, which has very similar symptoms to COVID, right? So uh, again, the only way we're gonna identify is through that testing process, but stay home, uh, continue to practice those mitigation strategies. 
Uh, it's not too late to get your flu shot either. There's still those available in the community. So uh, we would encourage people that have not done that to get their flu shot um, as we move forward. So uh, that's uh, the, the highlights of things. I know it was a lot. Uh, there's a lot to digest there. There may be additional questions. Uh, we're going to continue to try to um, try to try to make this as understandable and as intuitive as possible as we move forward. And, and with all these changes, um, there's going to be some kinks. Um, you know, people are probably going to have some frustrations with accessing things and understanding what they should be doing. Uh, we're asking for patience and, and some understanding here as we work through this transitional phase over the next couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully after we get through kind of the growing pains of this transition, things will, will smooth out. We'll kind of be in our new normal as we uh, operate in this um, uh, you know, response to COVID. And again, hopefully we'll see those numbers continue to, to, to start come down from the Omicron surge and uh, put us in better position as we move out of winter into spring. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dan um, to give the update on the healthcare side of things. So nice to have you here this morning, Dan, and uh, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Paul. And a special thank you to uh, Shelly and Matt um, uh, for inviting me to join you, uh, you all here today. And also, I want to extend a thank you to our media partners. Um, we appreciate all that you're doing to get the accurate message out that Paul's sharing and that I'm hoping to share with you about the hospital status uh, so that our community is most informed of what's actually happening um, and really helping to guide people to the best solution so we can work through this. Um, also want to extend a thank you to our, our own team members at Rochester Regional Health, our community uh, emergency preparedness uh, partners, including our uh, local law enforcement, emergency preparedness and fire and EMS agencies. Uh, you know, I, it's hard to believe, but we're approaching that uh, two year window uh, in, a, in a few months. And, and over that two years, we've stacked hands, collectively worked together uh, with one vision in mind, and that is to combat this ever changing COVID virus to keep community health and hospital services open and available to all of you and to the members of our community. Uh, for many of us, our friends, neighbors, and loved ones. So uh, a big thank you to all those folks that are working tirelessly out there uh, to make sure that continues to happen. And they are every single day. Uh, I'll start with giving a brief update on what the hospital situation looks like today. Uh, and then I'll talk about a few um, uh, changes over the last week. Uh, here at the hospital to respond to some of the things that Paul covered uh, related to the latest variant and how we're seeing the disease progress throughout the community. Um, overall today, uh, capacity at the hospital is sitting at right about 86% over the last seven day average. Um, so uh, that's been pretty consistent uh, at the throughout December and the end of December, we were in the 90% range. So it wavers up and down, but uh, you know, the last uh, week or so we've seen that uh, settle back in about the mid eighties. Um, and some, uh, some key important things uh, in our ICU, uh, as of yesterday's data, 100% of the patients admitted to the ICU were unvaccinated. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of speaks to what Paul talked about uh, and certainly the trend that we're seeing. Also, 100% of the patients on ventilators are unvaccinated. Um, and so the acuity is, is distinctly higher in those that are unvaccinated and, and our data has been consistent on that uh, throughout this latest surge. So, um, you know, you'll hear it over and over again from, uh, from Paul, from myself, Shelly and Matt. Please, please, please get your vaccine. Uh, it makes a difference, uh, and and we we are able to show it uh, in our data. Um, the uh, some other important uh, uh, numbers I think a lot of the area is tracking is um, uh, about out of the total population admitted to the hospital, about 36% of them are COVID patients. Uh, so we still have uh, about 64% uh, of non-COVID patients in the hospital. And I point that out because I think it's really important to know, you know, people are still seeking healthcare and they should be for what they need. And there are still patients who need healthcare outside of COVID. And so our job is to help strike that balance to make sure we have beds available, both for the non-COVID patients who, who need periodic hospitalization, uh, who need their chronic illness management or have an acute event such as an accident or, you know, appendicitis or a broken bone. So, uh, you know, services are open throughout our organization and throughout our community. Uh, we are balancing uh, between the needs of the COVID uh, virus response and the, uh, the traditional healthcare that is needed. 
Uh, but I will tell you that uh, about 70% of the of the patients that are admitted with uh, with with a di that have COVID, 70% uh, of them are here for COVID. Uh, it is the symptoms related to COVID that have driven them here. Uh, there's another 30% that are here that tested positive for COVID, but we're here for other reasons. So that that again is a an emerging number that I think people are looking at so they can understand the impact of COVID. So that that's what we're seeing in our in our hospital. Um, and so, uh, again, and out of the uh, out of that number of admissions, 75% um, uh, of the uh, COVID admissions are unvaccinated uh, people. Um, so I, I think the 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 data is clear. Um, the science is out there. Uh, unvaccinated folks are are uh, suffering from higher acuity. Um, we are seeing them in our hospital, and as you can see, they're layering on. Um, uh, over and above the traditional care management, which has made the hospitals throughout our region very busy. Um, so let me speak to a couple of points. Uh, one, services remain open at our hospitals. Uh, you know, we too, as many of our members of the hospital staff uh, it, uh, live in the community, um, do suffer from uh, occasional bouts of COVID uh, coming through our staff members, even though they're vaccinated. As we well know, even if you're vaccinated, you can get COVID. Um, and you have to follow the guidelines that Paul talked about, and we follow those guidelines as well. If they're COVID, then they're out of work uh, for the uh, for the quarantine um, or isolation periods as needed. Um, so periodically, you may hear of, hear us announce on our website or announce to the media that we might close a particular office or a particular outpatient area uh, because of uh, you know a certain factors. Sometimes that is because of lack of staffing. Um, and we just can't cover those uh, spots. But overall, I do want to say that even though we may close one location, our team has done an amazing job of, of accommodating them at other locations. That's been the beauty of both having a, a large footprint of multiple offices throughout the community, as well as being part of a uh, regional health system where we can pull uh, resources in to help cover and make sure that as many services stay open. But I always ask, stay tuned. Uh, you know, we do have to respond to what we're seeing in the community throughout even our own healthcare community. Um, so with that said, uh, I'll speak quickly to elective surgeries. Um, I think this is one as well. Uh, back in December, uh, we were above that 90% uh, occupancy rate, as I mentioned. Uh, and so we were notified at that time by the Department of Health that we had to limit our elective surgeries. Surgery still occurs here at the hospital, just on a much more limited basis. If you are at need emergent surgery, you can get that surgery at our hospital. If there are criteria that you meet that allows you to go to surgery and the state has given us those guidelines, you can get that surgery at our hospital. So surgery is not closed. It is just limiting it to limit the exposure of patients uh, as well as to manage the occupancy of patients in the hospital. The good news is since that time in December, we have seen a progressive uh, lowering of our occupancy. And while, as I reported earlier, we are below 90% for our last seven day average, last week, New York State, based on the community prevalence of COVID and the continued rising numbers, uh, did determine that um, the whole region was going to be on restricted elective surgery. So 40 hospitals in the region uh, were notified on Thursday and all have had a uh, uh, restrict to only essential surgeries uh, per the guidelines. And so we'll continue to work hand in hand with New York State uh, through that. Uh, we understand why that measure was taken. Uh, and as Paul's indicated, the numbers that we're seeing in the community concern all of us because we want to make sure our services are open uh, and available for all patients. So we have to take those necessary steps. Um, two other major steps uh, that are um, uh, that are going on here in response to what we're seeing is we did go into effect on January 11th, um, additional visitor restriction policies here. Uh, we had been able, since the last wave of COVID, been able to open up a little bit more visitation, uh, but because the community prevalence continues to go up and we want to be sure we're protecting the patients that are in the hospital as well as our staff, uh, we are restricting that. Visitation locally here at Batavia is from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. daily. Um, each visitor that does come in has to be screened at the front door, has to be, uh, their information has to be captured uh, for contact tracing unless they, in, in the event that they are exposed um, or turn out that they um, turn out to be positive and have to let us know. Um, 
couple areas, visitors can still not see patients who are on precautions for COVID-19. So that has been something consistent uh, throughout the COVID uh, you know, uh, period, and that continues. We also do not have visitation for emergency department patients based on the space requirements and the unknowns uh, that occur in that area. Um, cancer infusion center patients, uh, um, uh, also because of their uh, decreased immunity, uh, cannot have visitors. Um, and then there are the exceptions, and these been the traditional exceptions throughout. Pediatric patients can have visitation with uh, parents, and parents can be with them. Labor and delivery patients can have partners uh, and, and doulas uh, available. Um, uh, patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we're following the regulations related to providing uh, support personnel with them and cognitive impairment, uh, including dementia and patients at the end of life. We have protocols for all of those, so we can help with that uh, if, you, uh, if you check in. So just be aware, I ask if you have a loved one in the hospital, um, you know, things have changed this week. Uh, if you come and the screener um, advises you of different regulations, it's, it's because we've had to respond to this. Um, we all also are providing video visits for patients to their families uh, when they can't be seen, such as with the uh, uh, COVID positive, um, and you can reach out to our screeners and to the patient, uh, the staff on the units, and they will coordinate a video visit so that we want to make sure loved ones still continue to talk to each other, even though they have to be in isolation at times. Uh, the other thing that you're uh, you're seeing, and, and Paul commented as well, is uh, the latest data coming out on the masks and the eff efficacy of the masks. Um, and so we we too are responding to that. Um, uh, we are shifting our uh, mask utilizations. Uh, we will not allow cloth masks in the hospital environment at all, or any of our our um, our other healthcare spaces. Uh, staff uh, who were potentially wearing cloth masks in the past have switched to uh, medical masks. Um, and then those with direct patient contact are switching to a, uh, a tighter fitting, uh, I think uh, one example is the KN95s um, uh, mask that allow a tighter fit around the face. Um, so we're in the middle of that transition this week as well. Uh, we received a shipment of the uh, KN95s um, uh, through the, the health system and we've been deploying them at the most uh, risk, high risk areas, uh, but we'll, uh, we have many more on order and we'll continue to deploy them throughout that. If as a visitor you come and you have a cloth mask on or you come for a doctor's appointment, and you have a cloth mask on, our staff will provide you a medical mask to wear while you're wearing at that visit and they can provide instructions on either swapping it out or wearing both if you choose to do that. So um, we, uh, we will be asking anyone entering our buildings to wear those medical masks. Um, so. Please, if you have questions, ask our team. Our team is willing to give you guidance and, and, and definitely willing to, uh, uh, to guide uh, you know, all of us to stay safe as we go through this. Um, those are the major updates. Uh, as we said, volume stays fairly busy here. Our staff is doing a tremendous job um, and we continue to manage through all the ever uh, changes. Uh, the last thing I'll point out, uh, maybe not COVID related, but it's gonna get awful cold this weekend. And uh, we always see some impacts of that, both by community members uh, who maybe uh, you know aren't responding to the cold as well and they end up in our emergency department. So I just ask out to, to everyone, take care of each other, check on loved ones, make sure that you're prepared uh, for Saturday, not just for the Bills game, but for the uh, cold weather upon us. So um, go Bills and thank you again for having me here. And thanks for everyone for your support. From our team to all of you, we appreciate the partnership and making sure that we keep our community safe. Happy to respond to any questions when, uh, when you're ready for that. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Dan. At this point, uh, if, if anyone has any questions, they can take themselves off mute and announce who they are and, and you can fire away a question to uh, any one of us. Uh, Matt, this is Howard Owens. Can you hear me okay? Yep, fire away, Howard. All right, so I have uh, like four questions and uh, uh, and they're really all probably all for uh, Paul. So, um, Paul, you mentioned, you know, that uh, people are going to be reporting or have the ability now to report their home test results, positives. Um, are you going to report that out to the media, to the public as separate data? We'll be able, we'll be able to see how many home tests are turning up positive? Yeah, so we're, we're hoping to be able to capture that. Uh, as, as I mentioned, if, if someone uploads it through our portal, 
uh, on the website, then we're going to be able to log that as, as a test, right? Um, just like it would be coming from a lab, um, that the process would continue the same from there. Keep in mind, these do not go through eclairs, the state report, uh, the lab reporting system. These, these are home tests, but we're capturing the numbers that way. If, if, they, if you choose to do an OTC and do a home test and you don't upload that, no one's going to know about it, right? So it's only you taking that test at home. Uh, you're, you know, there's, it's, it's going to be harder to verify potentially for your employer if you're looking for COVID pay or anything like that. Those numbers are not being captured. Uh, I guess from the, the high level view, if you do that and you test positive, just stay home for your five days and, and, and follow the same protocol. But for the purposes of data tracking, uh, we would need that uploaded to our site. And then, um, you know, we'll look at how we can report that out, Howard, to make sure we can try to differentiate between the two. Okay. Um, you, you sort of touched on this, but I want to put maybe just a different spin on it. Um, the, you know, a year or so ago, you know, we were all pretty much, uh, those of us at least taking this seriously, were pretty much, you know, uh, staying out of public, not participating with family as much or going out to restaurants as much. Uh, now, you know, a lot more people are vaccinated, things have changed, but, you know, Omicron's out there. Um, just from masking and social distancing and going out, what would be your advice to, you know, people who still want to, you know, that we want to participate in society and not just remain in our homes, but we also want to remain safe? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, things are a lot different than they were a year ago at this time, right? Uh, we just started having the vaccine roll out a year ago. It was very limited. There wasn't enough vaccine available. I mean, we were focused on, you know, dance healthcare workers and uh, certain essential, uh, essential workers and employees. Um, you know, you fast forward a year, we have vaccines available for everybody down to the age of five. Uh, we have uh, booster shots available. We have, um, you know, different recommendations on masking and how to protect yourself. Um, we have uh, antivirals and, and different therapeutics and things that we can do to treat people once they have COVID. So we're in a completely different phase of this pandemic as we move towards, again, more of an endemic model than we were. Um, you know, and, you know, I think everybody has a certain level of risk uh, based on your own uh, medical, um, you know, background, your own personal issues and, and medical history that we're all different. So we all have different levels of severity and risk if we get COVID or any other virus. Uh, so, you know, it's very important to protect yourself, um, you know, and do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. And again, wearing that mask is a barrier. Is it foolproof? No. Is it going to stop all transmission? No. Um, you know, which is why some of that guidance out there has been changing to a well-fitting mask. And as Dan talked a little bit more about surgical or medical grade and KN95s and N95s, there's been a lot of talk about masks over the last two years. Uh, so we do know they're a barrier. They do help knock down some transmission. But, you know, again, the cloth masks, the, the buffs or the shirt pulled up, they're really not doing anything. So, uh, you know, again, it has to be done in line with the recommendations to, to try to reduce that risk. But, you know, ultimately, we want people to get back to their lives. People need to get back out and start socializing and engaging. Um, and we have tools to do it safely, um, you know, and following these recommendations and, and being, um, you know, as COVID wise and uh, educated as you can to make sure you're making decisions that first and foremost to protect you and your health concerns and needs. Uh, but also engaging in community and engaging with others. Um, I think, again, our tools we have now can position us well to do that safely and effectively, especially if you are exposed and you do get sick, you, you spend that time at home to make sure you're not spreading it to others. Um, and that's really the focus on the positives here and making sure they're kind of removed from the environment for up to that five-day period. Um, so we're really trying to lock it down at that level as best we can, but we need people to be um, responsible and, and have some self-awareness and, and some self um, uh, you know, driven compliance here to, to make that happen. Uh, if people don't do that, because we're, we're not monitoring like we were, um, we're not going to have the uh, oversight that we've had historically. So we're, we're going to be trusting people and encouraging them to, um, you know, take this step uh, to be um, honest and to um, take these steps on their own at this point. Uh, another thing, uh, topic I wanted to bring up with you is, uh, you know, see, it, there's been some news reports in the last week or so about you know, oh my God, guidance is changing again. There's new information out there, things are changing, and this is causing problems with the public and that they're turning away from COVID as seriously. I, I don't necessarily buy that the public's turning away, but I just want to give you a chance to address kind of, you know, this is how science works and, you know, we adapt. Yeah, well, we, we've maintained from day one. I mean, we can go backwards into, I mean, every, every time we talk, we say that this is what we know today, right? Um, this is a, a novel virus. It's new. Um, 
you know, it's two years old now, but it's still relatively new. And we, we've learned a lot about it as we've gone along. And, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, the, these changes seem like, why are they doing that? It makes no sense. And, it, you know, a lot of them is driven by what we're seeing. And has it always been perfect and right? No. Uh, have there been mistakes and, and shifts and changes? Yes. Uh, are there probably going to be more? I would say yes. Um, you know, but we, we go by what, uh, you know, the data is showing and what we learn about COVID and the disease and the specific variants that are coming out. And they help inform the decisions that we make. Uh, you know, and, and the, this information that we're sharing today, these recommendations and, and ideas and ways to try to keep yourself safe, your loved ones safe, uh, these are based on what we know today, the best way to, to try to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I think if anything, it shows that these changes are uh, helping us to evolve and, and hopefully try to thread that needle, right, and walk that line of, um, you know, keeping people safe, giving recommendations and, and not going the other direction of being onerous and just shutting things down and being so restrictive um, just because. Um, we, we're, we're learning, we're becoming educated, and, um, you know, these decisions, um, you know, that as they come, are, again, are going to be done. Um, you know, hopefully, again, looking at the science and the data and, and the idea of uh, offering uh, the, the, the freedoms and, and the decision, the, the, the self-choice that we want um, while trying to keep people safe as best we can. Great. Last question uh, comes from a reader on YouTube. Uh, he asks, what's the latest on when businesses with 100 and more employees will be required uh, to have weekly testing for unvaccinated individuals? Yeah, so that that's still uh, obviously that case is being heard by the Supreme Court uh, right now. Um, so, you know, I know Matt wants to speak a little bit to the timeline on some things, but, um, you know, we're still waiting to hear the final determination on if that's going to uh, essentially be kept in place or if that's going to be kicked out. Um, so we are waiting on that. But uh, Matt, I don't know if you have the timelines, but my understanding is it's actually in place now. It's just not necessarily being enforced. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's 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 in place. That I think the stay was uh, was was lifted, and it is being listened. It is being heard right now in front of the Supreme Court, um, and so we are all anxiously waiting to see if, if this is something that's going to move forward or not. Um, you know, we're here at Genesee County because we do have a workforce of over 100. And, you know, we are gathering the data. We've collected the data to understand uh, which which employees are and are vaccinated, and and uh, whether or not, uh, and, and and watching carefully to see um, what what the Supreme Court ultimately decides. Uh, before we go forward and implement and i think that's probably following suit with many other companies and, and and local governments as well moving forward but um all eyes right now are on the supreme court to see uh what ultimately is decided uh so matt can you break down how uh what percentage of employees are not vaccinated and kind of what's going to be the county policy towards unvaccinated individuals irregardless of the supreme court case yep so we're, we're sitting around uh 73 percent I think is what it was our number of, of, of identified and confirmed vaccinated employees. Um, and then from there, you know, we will follow the guidelines come out. So this, this is an OSHA mandate. So uh, it is, uh, we follow in New York state PESH and, and PESH typically follows suit uh, with OSHA, uh, but uh, we will, it's, it's a little bit of a, a further delay. Um, so it, it uh, you know, a 30 or 60 day delay after, after the OSHA mandate goes into effect. Um, but here in Genesee County, we'll, we'll follow if, if the Supreme Court doesn't set aside, you know, we will follow it and, and there will be a testing requirement for, for all unvaccinated county employees. Uh, we're still working out the, the process because this has an impact of, of you know, multiple bargaining units and, and, and we're going to make sure that we uh, make this as, as least intrusive as possible uh, to go through this process. But uh, you know, that's, that's something that uh, HR and uh, our compliance officer and our office are, are yeah. working through right now. Great, Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Hello, this is Jen Lukey from News 10 NBC. Um, I have two questions, one for Daniel and then one for Paul. Daniel, um, were you guys doing some electives until that mandate was handed down by the state recently? And if so, sort of how does that impact? That was probably, you were probably one of the only ones that wasn't at that 90% threshold. So how do you, have you had to cancel some things that you had set up? Hi, Jen. Thanks for the question. Yeah, um, it, in December, we were maintaining the ability to stay open a little bit beyond some of the other hospitals in the area because our numbers stayed below. And so we were pretty much full open. Um, and then 
it was that uh, third week of December, or the, I, the Thursday before Christmas, that you know, we had received the order and we had to stop uh, and, and reduce to just a le um, uh, essential uh, restricted elective. So we, w we continued to do some of the fit the criteria because uh, obviously if there are people who need surgery, they need the procedures. And so, so from then on, we've been maintaining that course. This latest one, um, it, it, the only uh, difference was we had seen our numbers drop below 90. So we were hoping to hear from the state we were going to be able to open back up. But that's when the state looked at the whole, whole region and felt that it was better to be, you know, uh, cautious and keep them uh, keep it restricted. So, uh, yes, uh, beyond a few of our other um, partners and some of the other hospitals in the region, we did stay up for a little longer in December. Uh, but since then, we've been on the restricted. So since you have that capacity, though, are they sent is like either your health system or the surgeon flex line sending you more COVID people or are they sort of trying to flex to your facility because you have the space? So we uh, we flex within uh, health system uh, pretty regularly. So we've been uh, throughout the, uh, the latest surge since I think back till September. Uh, we've been working closely with other uh, hospitals and the health system to take transfers uh, to uh, to kind of maintain that uh, that capacity and help uh, offload hospitals from other parts of the system. Uh, so we had done that uh, for quite a while and continue to do that when possible. And we also reach out to other partners around. Uh, we work closely with uh, you know Orleans Community Health uh, in talking with the the team over there. And if we can send patients uh, the, to their facility, we do. Um, so, and, and certainly we work between the other uh, hospitals, even outside of our system as needed. Um, so we do, uh, we do manage that load balancing across hospitals. And thank, thank you for that. Um, and Paul, you mentioned this briefly. Um, I did some stories yesterday about this letter that county health departments and school districts got about the changing guidance for quarantining student athletes and after school activities. Um, a lot of the districts told me we're going to wait and see until the full guidelines are out, but they are hoping that there is some local flexibility there. Um, is that what you're hearing from your districts? Is that what you're hoping for? Yeah, so uh, good question. And we have also been receiving a lot of uh, comments and questions on this. Uh, yeah, so we, we as <laughs> throughout this entire pandemic, we wanted local flexibility and some, uh, you know, opportunity locally to weigh in on some of these um, guidance and, and just have uh, based on what we're seeing locally in the needs. So uh, no different in this case. Uh, if you look at the January 3rd guidance on schools, it, it does say in there, unless your local health department has some different, um, you know, variations or is following some different protocols. So we're hoping when the updated guidance comes out, that type of language remains in there. Uh, that will give us the ability again to, um, you know, look at some of these different uh, guidance and guidelines that comes out and, and make some determinations if that's really the best fit and approach we want to do for Genesee and Orleans. Um, you know, so we are going to be waiting for that updated guidance. Uh, you know, I, I think again, we're, um, you know, leaning more towards again, if, if you know, again, we're doing tests to say for kids that are exposed in quarantine, if we're testing these kids regularly, um, you know, we'd like to see them to be able to participate in extra, after school extracurricular activities. Um, they're already testing negative for the day. Um, so we know that they're safe to be in school. Uh, so, so the risk at that point would be uh, no different from them being in school than participating in those extracurricular activities. So again, we're waiting for that updated guidance, but we are, um, you know, hopeful that we can uh, have some flexibility locally, even if the recommendation is not to let them play without uh, that booster shot when eligible. Paul, it's Tom Rivers with the Orleans Hub. Hey, I wanted to ask you about the vaccination rates. You said it's lower than you'd like. Is there a target percentage that you're aiming for? I think you said Genesee is currently 64, Orleans 61. And I don't oh. know, if, and if I could interject too, have you, some of the people who were reluctant to get vaccinated, have you noticed an increase in them in the last month or two? Well, you know, so, there isn't a magic number. Obviously, there's been different talks around where to get to herd immunity. And then obviously you have folks that now have had COVID and specifically with the last, latest surge of Omicron, a lot of people have had uh, COVID. So you, there's natural antibodies that come into play that obviously are effective, um, you know, in, in preventing uh, additional reinfections, et cetera. Um, you know, the state obviously put in, in place that 70% number uh, last year. That was the target going into the summer was get to 70%. Uh, if you look statewide, again, we are above that number now in, in as a whole uh, for the entire population. Um, you know, our numbers are creeping up slowly. I, I would say that the majority of 
are newer folks getting vaccinated. Uh, it's mainly because of some type of mandate or some life um, need, right? They need, they need it to travel, they need it to um, you know, go on a vacation, they need it for work, uh, you know, any type of these mandates. So we're not seeing a lot of folks um, coming to get vaccinated now at the moment right now because they've um, you know, made a decision today's the day, basically. It's usually being driven by some other uh, need or issue or a family member. Uh, you know, we see a lot of uh, folks make determinations to move forward with something if, if uh, you know, a family member dies or has a severe case of COVID, you know, so that we call those cues to action. Uh, you know, when, when those happen, you know, that generates people to respond and say, well, you know, this person I knew, this loved one just had a very uh, uh, serious case of COVID or unfortunately may have passed and I don't want that to happen to me. Um, or pressure from family, you know, hey, go get your shot because I don't want that to happen to you. So uh, I think there's some of that going on now. Uh, and so we're really trying to talk to those folks that are still undecided and still thinking about whether they should get vaccinated, whether the vaccine's safe, uh, you know, those type of questions that folks still have. And we, we always refer folks to their um, primary care provider, the medical provider, if they have any questions, again, based on their unique medical history or uh, any questions they may have, if the vaccine's right for them. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're seeing again, based on the data we shared and what Dan, Dan shared about hospitalizations and ICU and vents that uh, the vaccine is very effective. Um, it does keep people uh, from having uh, severity of disease and keeps them off the ventilators, keeps them out of the ICUs, especially the booster shot now. Um, so we'd like to see higher numbers. Uh, they are creeping up, but we are lower than the Finger Lakes average and we are lower than the state average. So we do have some room to grow there. And uh, again, we're just hoping that with the messaging, with the uh, information we're providing and continuing to just uh, uh, push that out there that these folks will make that decision at some point um, in the near future. Not hearing any more questions, I think that um, there has been an extremely thorough job done in explaining all of the new guidance. And if you have further questions, our websites are available for the County Health Department and also um, CN Ireland. Thank you for joining us with your hospital capacity information and, and what is still available in our community. We really are very, very fortunate to have the leadership that we do have in Genesee and Orleans counties for our health department, and especially the staff, which has not given up on us yet. And dear Lord, we certainly do appreciate them and their every waking moment that they spend taking care of everyone here in Genesee County. Thank you to our media partners, and I'll sign off. Thank you, everyone.